Hey everybody, it's Mark. I'm back again with another great episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. And before we get to this week's guest, I want to remind everyone that if you want to find out more of these incredible pods of amazing people doing incredible things, make sure you check out www.markpattisonnfl.com. And there's a podcast in all the different places on iTunes and Stitcher. Uh, you can find really incredible episodes. We continue to build as we uh, round third base on going past 200 episodes, which is really cool. Please go in to the iTunes tab and give me a ratings and review. I've said this before. It's not about the popularity. It is about trying to raise the profile of these awesome people coming on the pod. There's also Amelia's Everest. I continue to fundraise for my daughter who has epilepsy. We have now partnered up with Higher Ground here in Sun Valley, New York, and Los Angeles, a great organization. You can find out more about them on, on my site. And as always, I will be headed off to Mount Everest in about eight months from now and uh, look forward to that so there's a blog you can follow everything trying to become the first nfl player to climb the seven summits i'm very close to making all that happen all right this week we've got an awesome guest he's another fellow nfl alum merrill hodge merrill how you doing well now that i'm with you boys um i'm i'm well because it's been an arduous uh, journey just trying to get together <laughs> it's all been on me now you guys it's been all on me no, I totally appreciate that. And of course, you're saying is find a way. We're going to di- dive into that here shortly. I've also got Jim Mora, who's been on the pod several times to add some color to this. Uh, he and Merrill also go back um, quite a ways. And so they've known each other and crossed each other's paths during the NFL um, back in the day. You know, the thing that just jumped out to me, you're a guy who played eight years in the NFL. You had this amazing career, primarily with uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers, but you know, of all places, big time players, more likely than not, usually go to the big schools. I mean, there's your there's your uh, outliners like Jerry Rice or something that went to Mississippi Valley State, Mississippi Valley State, right? Yeah. Something like that. But you end up going to Idaho State, right? Not the biggest, not the smallest, but you're up there in Pocatello, Idaho. We're sitting here broadcasting today from Sun Valley, Idaho. We're not that far away. We've both been through through Pocatello, and that is a small dot on the map. Yep, yep. It's not a big place. Um, I, I remember uh, for years I thought they that they didn't play football outside that state because I went from kindergarten through college in my hometown. Okay, I only got <laughs> on a plane. I only got a plane one time in college, and then the only time I flew by myself was um, when I went to the combine. And actually, this is how this is how green I was <laughs> back then. You know, it isn't like you fly today where you know you got on an app and you just keep on it. They give you your, the NFL mails you your ticket. So I got on the plane, flew over, threw it away when I got there. When I went to leave, went to leave, they go, "You got your ticket?" I was like, "What ticket?" <laughs> they gave it to you. They gave it. I was like, "Oh, I threw that away." That's like I'd never flown before. I'm by myself. I'd only flown. That was only the second time I ever got on a plane was uh, to go to the combine in Indianapolis. So again, considering that you went so far in your in your NFL life, you know, were, were there not other offers that you had to consider coming out of high school? Uh, well, no, I, I had one offer. Um, and I'm sure you guys will know that. I know Jim will know this. I, you might know him. Um, Dirk Cutter. Yep. Okay, Dirk Cutter, who's, who I think he's in Atlanta right now. Yeah, he's the OC um, in Atlanta now. Yep, um, Marvin Lewis. Okay, both of those guys played at Idaho State together. So I knew Marvin Lewis and Dirk Cutter um, when I was going, when I was, well, when I was in junior high. I mean, Dirk was like the, the um, like the man in, in, the, in the state, in the, in, the, um, in the city, because what a good football player he was. His dad was an outstanding football coach. Very, I mean, truly one of the best football player coaches I'd ever been around. Long story short, Dirk ends up being my high school coach my senior year in at Highland High School. So when my senior year is done, he tells his dad, who's the, who's the offense coordinator for uh, Idaho State, who ends up being the head coach because the Dave Cragthorpe ends up leaving the year they were recruiting me. And I was actually second on their list. So I wasn't even first. It's the only offer I got. Dirk actually begged his dad to give me an offer. <laughs> 
or I don't get an offer. I don't get an offer if I, uh, if I don't, uh, I don't get it from Idaho state. So once they offered me, um, I didn't, that didn't, didn't take me long. Cause here's the ultimate goal is I wanted to play in the NFL. That's I've had that goal since I was 12. Uh, shoot, since I was eight, since I saw it on television. And that's why, so all I looked at is I can't go to every college. You can only go one. You can have a hundred scholarship offers. You can only go to one. So that's all I needed. I just needed a chance. And, um, and I got that chance, and um, I wanted to start as a freshman. Herschel Walker, I remember when he started, that guy was kind of a big deal when Herschel Walker started. And so, like, starting as a freshman was a big deal, you know, and I think kind of – it was a bigger deal back then than maybe it is today. But um, that I thought I would give me a chance to start as a freshman. So, I got to Idaho State. I was – there was eight running backs on our depth chart, and I was number eight. But by game four, I was starting. So, and I started for – I started that day on for the next 12, 12 or so years into the NFL. Yeah, absolutely incredible. You know, we share some of the some same story. Um, you went into the league, you were drafted in 1987. I was drafted in 1985 by the Raiders. My first recruiting, well, my first time on an airplane was when I was 18 years old and I got a recruiting trip to Hawaii. So who wouldn't take the trip to Hawaii, right? <laughs> but that was the first time I was on an airplane and it was different. So, Younger people that are listening to this pod, you don't understand because between FaceTime and texting and cell phones and internet and travel, affordable travel, it's just a whole different time. I mean, my kids have been all over the world twice, you know, and, and it's just a it's just, it's just a different era than when it was back in the day. And so you weren't exposed to going outside your backyard. You know, Jim, you, you know, you coached at UCLA and you were used to bringing in guys from not just LA, yeah. but all over the country. Yeah. I have a few guys every year that their, our first road trip would be their first time on a plane. But, uh, you know, I think what, what you went through, you know, going to growing up where you did going to Highland high school, going to Idaho state, your only offer. And then being a 10th round pick of the Pittsburgh Steelers had to be at that point, just like a, an amazing dream come true. Yeah, you know, Jim, I, uh, I remember, you know, it's funny. I, you know where I was projected to go? I was projected to go to the Raiders in the third round. The really? irony of the Raiders. You had to sit there and watch all those guys get picked. Yeah. yeah. And I thought, um, you know, and they, they were talking about, I remember when the Houston Oilers um, called my agent. You know, they, and they ended up drafting Alonzo Highsmith in the first round. You know, there was, back then, the fullback position, think about this, in 87, I think, High Smith goes in the first round. Um, Roger Vick from Texas A&M yep. goes in the first round to the Jets. Um, and both of those guys were obviously ranked um, higher than I was. Um, but I was supposed to go within a few rounds after that. And that, you know, still, it was back then, it was three days to not the hoopla it is today, but I had to wait till day three. Um, but when the Steelers called me, I'll never forget, um, the scout who came in to work me out again, who never worked me out, by the way, he just asked me if I played basketball. And I was like, it's, I was like, oh, I left the conversation. I was like, because you know how you go to work out a kid, you know, the team tells you they're coming in, they'd like to work out A, B, and C. The kids meet them and they want to do A, B, and C. He's the only guy who didn't want to work me out after the combine. He just asked me if I played basketball because the Steelers have a basketball team that they played in the off season. So when I walked out, I was like, all right, of all the teams that have come here to work me out again, they're not interested. <laughs> he only cares about basketball, but he was the guy who called me when they drafted me. And I remember he said, Hey, do you want to be a Pittsburgh Steeler? And I said, absolutely. He goes, I just want you to know something. You can make this team. And that's all I need to hear. When he told me that, he goes, you, because we need you. Um, we, and listen, now I go back. I mean, maybe every coach or, you know, I'm sure nobody calls up and go, Hey, we really don't need you, but we're drafting you. Right. You know? But that you know him telling me that and he was a straightforward guy you know like when the reason he didn't want to work me out is like i've seen every because i'm look this kind of starts off where i've always believed in football he was watching my tape he's like this is what i need yeah which is true that's what he needs i mean that other part's an athletic event that has nothing to do with football but what he was doing was watching me so it's you all know, good. you know it's about watching guys play football and then the question about basketball was is he a dual sport athlete or, you know, does he have athleticism, spatial awareness? Obviously, you know, maybe there's some things they couldn't see on film, 
but they knew that you were a competitor. They probably are, had done tons of research on you. They knew that Idaho State was your only offer, and you knew that all you needed was one school to go to to make that opportunity happen. And and then as a guy who's a you know projected to be a third round pick drop into the tenth round, a, a lot of times just this uh, this disappointment sets in that they can't overcome. You know, and they have this chip on their shoulder that becomes so heavy that it drags them down. And I'm sure they recognize in you that this was just another challenge that you would overcome, that you would face, that you would conquer, that you would make the team and then have eight years in the league. And I mean, it's just, it's kind of what Mark always talks about on these podcasts is, you know, overcoming adversity, you know, finding a way to the top. And it sounds to me, and in, in having known you and known what you've gone through, and we're only, you know, at the start of your NFL career is that you're that type of man. You've always had goals, objectives, a plan to get there. And no matter if there's disappointment or not, you just, like your hat says, you find a way. Well, you know, you guys will identify with this. And for people who watch and listen, um, and maybe more than likely, I think everybody's dabbled in sports a little bit. Um, but if you haven't, um, I always like to use a, a quitter slash losing locker room versus a champion winner successful locker room. Um, the language is different in both. You know, when you look at a, a quitting locker room, um, this type of verbiage is used, this type of mindset is used. They point fingers, they cast blame, they make excuses. They create this recipe. It's not me. It's everybody around me. It's not me. It's something else happened to me. There's no accountability. There's no responsibility. That locker room will always be a losing locker room. You will never find success in a locker room like that if that's the environment that you want to be in. Right. Um, but the champion locker room, a successful locker room, the first thing that that champ does, successful people do, you self-evaluate. You self-evaluate. That is the most important thing that especially I have learned that you must do if you want to grow and you want to get better. Then you got to make the correct changes. Then you create a plan and then you take action. Now, the beautiful part of that, there's not a person watching this or listening to this that doesn't get to choose what locker room you wanna be in. Because it is about an approach, it's about a mindset, and I don't care what your circumstances are. If you're gonna start right off going, well, this is, a, you're, okay, we know what locker room you're in. Just go get in the locker room. Stay in that locker room. And if you wanna stay doing blame and pointing fingers and casting blame, that's where you'll stay. But you want to go over here and self-evaluate the first thing you do, make changes, corrections, evaluate, and then take action. I will promise you great things can happen. The, the luxury about that, everybody has, everybody can be in the winning locker room if they choose. It's about your mindset. It's about your approach. But it's an everyday approach. And I'll tell you, uh, a guy that both of you will know, um, you may have played, um, well, I'm sure, or you probably played against him, um, Walter Payton. Yeah. One of the most powerful things I ever heard a human being say it. I was a Walter Payton fan. In fact, I'm trying to look at my Chicago helmet, my, my bear helmet where Walter signed. That's another story where uh, I have, I basically have a few signatures. One of them is Walter Payton's. Riddell was trying to get me to wear all these new helmets they were coming out with, and I did not want to wear it. I liked the bike helmet that I had, right? So Walter and I were, he was in the locker room when I was playing in Chicago. And uh, we've been talking on the practice field before and he came in the locker room and I'm not going to show this other story, but the first time I ever met him, I asked him for an autograph, which was an embarrassing situation because it was right after a game and he doesn't, you know, who, who carries a pen other than T.O., right? right. <laughs> <laughs> Peyton doesn't have a pen on it. Okay. Anyway, so we were joking about that time I met him and, uh, and I'm like, you know, I never got that autograph. I go, I'm start thinking if I get him to sign this helmet, they will get off me. They're, I'm done. I'm done with him trying to get me to wear the helmet. So he signed my helmet. I never had to say, I never had to, I never had to wear that helmet again. Um, so, uh, but, but going back to what he really impacted me um, directly and indirectly, but this is more an indirect part. I was searching for things as a kid. And this is important, for, I think, for anybody that's trying to accomplish something or do something in life, search out those people who are really good at it that might have some insight and some wisdom that they could share with you to help you in the process. So my thought process, um, this is on my age 12 when I'm thinking through this, I don't come across this till age 15, but Walter Payton was putting out a tape called winning in life. 
And I was like, wow. I, th- th- and he was going to talk about charity work, his family, and how he trained. Okay, well, at age 15, I don't care. I don't give a rat's rump about charity work. I don't give a rat's rump about family. I care about training. I want to know, hey, what does he eat? What does he do? I knew he'd run these dirt hills. I heard things yeah. about it. I was like, man, I just want that tape for that. So I get the tape. I plug it in. And I'm scrolling through trying to find the things that interest me. And I didn't realize there was an interview process. Well, I stop it right at the interview process. First question, the lady asks him, what makes you better than everybody else? Well, you know, this time, Walter Payton was the all-time leading rusher. He had eclipsed the title. Um, um, I think pound for pound, he's the greatest player to ever play. He said something as profound as I've ever heard a human being say it. It resonated with me then. It still resonates with me today. He stopped for a second. And, you know, I just don't assume everybody knows. I know you guys know who Walter Payton is. But there'll be a lot of people who may be listening and go, like, who is Walter Payton? Um, this was always said about Walter Payton. He's not the biggest. He's not the strongest. He's not the fastest. He's just the best. Well, that's confusing as a kid because, you know, you grow up thinking, oh, everybody who's great, they're the biggest, strongest, fastest. And that is so untrue. When, and then it, he clears it up after he's asked what makes him better than anybody else. He paused. I, he, he said it as profound as I've ever he, heard a human being say it. He looked at her and he said, I want it more than they do. Every day of the week. He said, you see in the off season, when I want to run that dirt hill at six in the morning, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and nobody wants to join me, I want it more than they do. We're getting ready to play Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. No fans are in the stands. There's not cameras rolling. I want it more than they do. And then at one o'clock on Sunday, oh, you better believe I want it more than they do. Well, as a 15-year-old kid, I can't even tell you what it did for me then and still does to me that, to the, today. I can do that. There's not a soul that's out there that can't do that. And that doesn't have to be sports. That can be applied to anything that you want. And if you're passionate about something, that's the commitment that you take. If you want something, that's the commitment it takes. And that that everyday approach, I have never forgotten that because it is so easy to want things. It's so easy to put a goal up. It's so easy to say, I want to do A. But then when it comes down to putting in the work every day, you start getting a different interest level and that's what it ultimately takes. And that's about a habit. It's about a mindset. And I learned that early, early on. I mean, from that day on, and I heard that every day I played practice um, or trained, I would think about that and I made it a habit. And here's what I did uh, that I'm at peace with. Ultimately I thought as a kid, I'll be as good as Walter Payton if I do it. Okay. That's what a kid was thinking. Right. Well, then when I, my career's over. I'm like, what an epic failure when I, when I match myself up to Walter Payton. But then I was like, you know what? It took me a long time to get to this point. I got the mo- I got everything out of my talents. I maximized my talents. I did the, I got everything out of them. So I'm like, you know what? I finally had peace. I was like, I have peace with that. And I think if people, if you can have peace with that, you did everything possible. You exhausted everything possible. And wherever you end, it might be the greatest of all time at whatever you're going for. And good for you. And I hope it is like that. But if it's not, it doesn't mean you're a failure. You know, if you got the most, you did your part, you should have peace with that no matter where you ended up. And he was he's just been an instrumental part of my life as a kid and, you know, even in my everyday life today. So uh, let me unpack just a little bit of that. And I know Jim wants to jump in. You know, a lot of the things you were just talking about to me is success leaves clues, right? And so for anybody out there listening, you know, just like Meryl's talking about, one of the things I've always tried to do, and I know Jim has tried to do, is just really find those mentors out there that you want to be like, that you respect a lot, you understand their work habit and their ethic and, and what they've been able to achieve have been phenomenal, right? There, there's There's... Uh, John Wooden, who I, I quote, you know, quite a bit um, because it had such a dramatic impact on me from Don James at the University of Washington. But that top rung um, in that pyramid of success is competitive greatness. And I think everything you just talked about, Merrill, when you boil it all the way down, you, you break it down. There's all these, you know, there's 25 ind- individual, ind- uh, individual and team blocks that create the pyramid at the very top to win the championship, to be the best, all those things. But, you know, really, when you when you string it down. It's about loving the process. And that's where when, when you don't have that, that desire, that passion, 
that strong why, it's hard to have that daily discipline that you were talking about, about trying to be the best because, you know, every morning when you have to get up and you go run the hill, you go and, and you're in the sand, whatever you're doing, you're not going to always wake up every day, springing out of bed, going to do those things. And if you don't have that strong passion about why you're doing those things, you know, you're going to check out, you're going to quit. And that's what happens with far too many people. So it's finding that passion and being so committed with tenacity and just being ferocious about where you're trying to go after. It's, it's creating, it's discipline, right? It's discipline. I mean, we all move in and out of motivation, but if you have a level of self-discipline and a commitment, when you're fully committed, then you're able to accomplish those things. Yeah. I ask you this, you know, so you go into Pittsburgh as a 10th round pick and you're a fullback. Was there even a doubt in your mind that you wouldn't make that football team? No, yeah. no. I'm going to tell you this. Um, I think there was, uh, um, I only, I only had hesitation. Now keep in mind back then, Jimmy, you might remember they cut, they'd cut, they, they could cut, they cut people like every day. Yeah. And after every preseason game, I mean, there's a half a dozen to a dozen people gone. I remember on the last cut, the last preseason game, I didn't play at all, which kind of concerned me a little bit. I was like, oof, that probably ain't good. But um, once I made the team, when I got up and I was uh, on the roster, I never, ever, ever worried about making a team again from that day on. I never bothered. I know no matter who they brought in, no matter how good people were, um, I never doubt. I never worried uh, another day about it. You know, and to kind of build on all this, uh, you know, Jim, it's funny um, seeing you on the screen. I'm a product of a lot of people. Um, and I think that individually that we're all strong, but collectively we're powerful. We've learned from one another. Um, you know, when I was doing the draft a lot, let's see, Jim's been, um, when I think about people who have impacted me, like very seldom do I do a Zoom call. And I'm like, okay, now this guy impacted me. When I was working for SPN, you know, I would I would call Jim a lot. And I'm going to tell you, he's very gracious. And he always had great wisdom and insight, you know, because the guy's in the trenches. I can watch tape all day long. You're still missing that, that real intel stuff, you know, that if you have relationships, I'd like to learn some of it you don't ever share. But uh, you were in San Francisco at the time. I can't remember the DB we're talking, but I – I used it in my language every time and I, it would widen my scope as an evaluator. Um, but the moment of truth, you use this moment of truth and, uh, you know, about balls in the air. Yeah. And then, so and I was like, you know, I was like, you know, that I've always used that from that day on, you know, and he, he's the one that really brought it to my attention. And I was like, okay, I don't ever get outside that scope. You know, I don't get out of that scope with Walter Payton unless Walter Payton does that. Jim Mora goes, well, and you're looking at this kid, I love him at the moment of truth. Balls in the end. I'm like, oh, I never thought of that. That's, that, that's awesome. You know, like, how do you just explain that? How do you get people to see that? And what, that's another layer to look at a player. So um, this was kind of nice to do this too, because I got a guy here that, you know, during my journey and being an analyst helped me grow as an analyst. I mean, and I've so many people have done that, you know, from, geez, Chuck Knoll, um, uh, Bill Cower, trying to um, shoot, I work with Coach Ditka for ever. I mean, and there's there's just wisdom beyond belief with guys like that. But there are so many coaches that have those great minds. But when you see people like this guy, I'm like, I'll, I'll never forget that conversation. You know, that's got to be 20 years ago, too, by the way. You know, but I still used it and it helped me become a better analyst. You know, uh, you growing up in Idaho, myself in Seattle, Washington, and especially back in those times, early 80s, um, and even when we were younger, I think it was really hard to imagine um, people that you surrounded yourself with the enormity of a gigantic organization like the NFL. So to put yourself there and say, one day I'm going to play in the NFL as you're looking at me. I mean, nobody could associate that. And so there has to grow this self-belief that you can do anything. And it doesn't matter what the odds are. It's that rocky thing where you just have to believe in yourself and you have to do whatever it takes to get yourself to that, to that mountaintop. Um, you've got this great saying, find a way. And I want to go and I want to dig into that because it seems like it's had such a profound effect on your life, on the way you raise your kids, on some other obstacles that we'll get into in a minute about things you've had to overcome. So let's start there. Where did the whole find a way motto come <clears throat> in your past? Well, it came at my first 
actually, Jim, this is my first moment of truth. <laughs> I use moment of truth now in, in life terms. Um, I was 12 years old. My dad, I had only had, I, I, my bedroom was me, my little brother, and bunk beds. That's all I ever knew. We were 13 months apart, so I knew no different. Um, I heard, write down your goals. And I'm like, well, that's nearly impossible because I need a sanctuary. I need my own room to do that. I prayed diligently every night that, you know, the bunk bed or my brother would both disappear. Doesn't mean I didn't love him. I just like, I want my own bedroom. I finally get my own bedroom. We had a, our, our concrete base. My dad announces we're going to convert it to three bedrooms and a family room. And one of the bedrooms is going to be mine. So I had always thought, if I ever have my own bedroom, I'd like a wall of cork made. Because then I could put goals up. I could, I could really use that as my sanctuary. It's where I start and I end my day. So I asked my dad. He said he'd see what he could do. He gets done. And I wrote, I'd written out all my goals. I still have junior high, high school, college to play. But it was going to be a pyramid, if you will, all these goals. And at the top was going to be, I will play in the NFL. So room gets done. I go walking in. My bed's bumped up against a chair rail. It's half a uh, wall of cork, not an entire wall, but man, it was big enough. It was bigger than I ever dreamed of. I'm pinning my goals up. I'm sitting there looking at, I will play in the NFL. This is probably why I see things through a child's eyes more than most adults do. Because every, every adult that asks me, hey, what do you want to do when you grow up? I go, oh, I'm going to play in the NFL. One of four things was always said to me right away. Oh, you know how hard that is? You know what the odds you playing in the NFL are? Oh, don't put all your eggs in one basket. We would never want you to be disappointed, son. Or it was impossible. Now, what I do love about kids and young people is they're so resilient. Like, that never phased me. It didn't, didn't fracture me at all. It didn't didn't discourage me at all. Until I get to that moment of truth where I'm on my bed, I'm looking at that goal, and then I start thinking. I revisit all the things that were told to me. Because the people who were supposed to encourage me, they're the first ones to discourage me. So now it is going to play a role because I'm looking at that and I'm like, God, oh, nobody's ever said this is, you know, like I could do it. I never got, I never got a, yes, you can do that, son. And the more I thought and let myself go down that road, the more I will play in the NFL words on a wall. There was no energy behind it. It was just, I put it on a wall. And this is the, word, time, the first time those words find a way when they popped into my head I am telling you, it, it sent an energy. It's the word I always used. It gave me an energy that changed me. It inspired action. And I've already mentioned that uh, a little bit, but that's the first time that I thought, hey, listen, you got control of this. You have a responsibility, though, to go find a way to do that. That's what sent me on the search for Walter Payton. That's what I, my first journey or first, my first object was. I was like, well, let's go find out things about Walter Payton I don't know that might help me. What more can I add to what I'm trying to do to help me build faster and more efficient? Well, he's the best to ever do it. I'm like, shoot, let me go find out what he did. So it sent me on this, this journey of action. And those that's what the words do and have done for, they still do to me over on my, my, on my office right over here on my wall. I have the words find a way every day. And I, I add it every day later on after the Walter Payton thing, because that's when it really, it became surreal for me that that's what matters. You know, if you're going to put something on the wall and you're never going to revisit it, then it's words on the wall. But if you stay focused to it and committed to it and it's every day, it becomes a habitual thing. And it doesn't have to, like I've said this already, but it doesn't have to be sports. It can be anything that you want to apply that to in your life. Um, it doesn't have to be sports. It can be a challenge. It can be other goals, other objectives. And what happens is, it becomes you. You just it starts to be embedded in you. Our minds are a powerful tool. I always say, do you control your mind or does your mind control you? Well, having a place where you start and end your day and you have goals, for me, it has been one of the most powerful things I've ever done because it keeps me on task. I take that even at night, I'll go through it. Okay, Jim will appreciate well, both of you appreciate this. You know, after mini camp, you get the entire playbook. And they give you two weeks, and they're very – I love coaches, man. They go, hey, listen, you can make uh, make mistakes this week and that week. You get back training camp, you make one mistake, I'm cutting you. I mean, that's <laughs> – they're like, you can go home and – oh, my gosh. And you made so many mistakes, you're like, oh, this is just... – how can I go back to training camp? And this is actually a great um, example of how powerful our minds are if we exercise them right. So I decided to do this. I write down every play in these, like, like these 10 by 12 cards. I, I got that cork wall I'm telling you about. 
I have three panels. So I have like the 70s, 90s, the passing game, right? Screens, draws, all. I write every play down and put it on my board, draw it out, write my, my, write my assignment down and all the things I can remember about the play. Before I went to bed every night, okay, so I have about six weeks here, say a month, I go through every one. Now, does that take me an hour and a half or so? Yeah. If I go through every play, walk through it, what I said, what it sounds like. Because I was so worried. Like, they, they get in the huddle. They go, you know, red, right, dog, seven, seven. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa time out. I, what did you say? Like, the, when I first said, I'm like, I don't even know what they're saying. Was, so then I get up every morning. I do the same thing. I go through the same exercise. I go through it. I walk into training camp. I will never forget. I walked into the huddle the first time a play was called he gets about three words out i already know what i'm doing yeah i like i've heard i mean i'm telling you it was the most powerful you talk about just another confirmation where it, it could be a fabulous tool anybody can use and to do it over and over in the morning and at night man so i controlled my mind i didn't i didn't sit there and do anything about it and just worry for a month go call i hope i remember i hope well of course i'm not gonna remember if i do that i did absolutely nothing to help me prepare but in the order I, I prepared, it just was another example of how powerful that can be for a human being. It doesn't matter what it is that you can apply. So I, I want to ask Jim, um, you know, I have a, a, a saying, uh, it's not find a way, but what is it? Uh -huh. What is my saying that I have posted on my wall downstairs? It, it takes a little more to make a champion. It takes a little more to make a champion. And yeah, that's from the old champion brand. It, it is. But that's one of those things that, um, you know, Dan, I, I, you know, we were talking earlier before we went live, Merrill, and you're talking about COVID has kind of wreaked a little havoc on everybody, obviously, for the obvious reasons. But just for the non-obvious, you know, the gyms have been shut down. And so what do you do to stay conditioned? And, you know, with for me, you know, I have a big goal out that's out there right now with Mount Everest. You know, it's not just a trivial mountain. I mean, it's, it's serious, right? And so something I've got painted up on my wall, and I've always had this, and Jim has known this, that something that we learned from a coach, a quarterback coach back in the day at the University of Washington, Ray E. Dorr, and he used to say, it takes a little more to make a champion. It takes a little more to make a champion. So I've had that as my motto up there, because if you, if you, if you boil that down, you know, you can't be average. It's easy to be average. Anybody can be average. What does it take to be great? And then what are those things? Again, if you kind of like backfill into it, all the things that you've talked about doing, what are the goals? What are the steps you need to take? What are the day-by-day -day things you need to do? That's what drives me. And that's what gives, again, in the back of my head, have I done all I can possibly do to prepare for this massive goal in eight months, right? No different from you and no different from you from your coaching. Well, I think you guys are both saying uh, something that's really profound and important for people to hear, especially young people to hear. And you said it earlier, Meryl, um, and I'm going to talk about three things here really quick, but it's getting the best out of what you, what you are capable of. It's reaching your potential. And Joe Montana, you know, you talk about asking for autographs. I never wanted to ask for autographs, but, you know, first time I meet Joe, I'm like, hey, Joe, can I <laughs> Not your autograph. I think I'm coaching against him, you know, after the game, <laughs> like a 12 year old. I'm the Divas of Corey and I walk over the ball and have your autograph. But, you know, he wrote, uh, you know, jump to Jim, Joe Montana, be your best, not be the best, but be your best. And that always stuck with me. And it's something I always, I sign now too to kids is be your best because I think sometimes the thought of being the very best can be overwhelming and you can't control everybody else, but you can control yourself you control your attitude you control your work ethic and which brings me to number two which is commitment you know there's different levels of commitment there's there's partial commitment there's conveniently committed right and there's fully committed and when i listen to you and i'm with mark you know every day and you guys are two guys that overcame not overcame but you were drafted late and you still attained your goals. And I, you know, I know your work ethic as a player. I've played against you, you're top. I've played with Mark. There's a, there's a level of commitment that is always a full commitment, fully committed, no matter what. And there's a great definition of that, which I won't read now. And then the third thing is to be that, to do that, to do what you're talking about, to do what Mark's talking about, it's hard. But hard things are hard, right, Merrill? Hard things are hard, which is another statement I like. And you know, you guys, you're, you're a lot alike, and it's fun to hear, but I, I just think you, you talk about being your best, being fully committed, and understanding if you want something, it's going to be hard. There is no easy way. 
But you know what? Something that, you know, just listening to you guys, I, you know, I could sit and listen all day, you know, because um, listen, find a way resonates with me. That doesn't mean it has to resonate with anybody else, but hopefully something does. You know, that's what you care. What, I don't, whatever resonates with you, man, that's what you want. Because I know what's possible for people if they put their minds working for them and use things they can learn from other people and put it in action to whatever it is they're striving for or whatever they want, whatever they're passionate about. If you can get people in the right locker room with the right mindset and the right approach, man, their lives are going to be uh, enriched because when you come overcome things or accomplish things, man, there's, I don't know of any, you can't, money can't buy that. Money cannot buy that. You know, there are some things in life that, you know, money cannot buy. And, you know, everybody talks about happiness, which is true. But when you talk about accomplishments and self-gratification where you have done something and you've overcome something or you put your mind to something and you've you've given everything that you have had and you can look in the mirror and go, man, I did my part. I did my part. I did everything possible. I had peace with that. That's a great feeling. That is an awesome feeling. And the other thing. I got Joe Montana's signature here. I swear to you, I'm going to pull it up. I don't have, if he doesn't say to me, too. <laughs> if he didn't say to me what he said to me, I'm like, I got to see this. Because I've never, actually, I've never looked at, oh my gosh, I it's never knew that. Right? Meryl. Yeah, I used to be, it's either be the best, it's got to be be your best. Yeah, that's I, I, this might say be the best to you. He may be, yeah. he's just uh I uh, underselling me a little bit. But well, be the best. Uh, okay, so I was like, I, you know, I, I don't think I'd ever looked at it hard. So yeah. I, I, I got to pull that out and see. Be the best. Be your best. Be yeah. We'll just say hey. be your best. Let's be your best. <laughs> hey, so listen. Speaking of that, I, I had to look at that and see. <laughs> so you have a great run in the NFL. Eight years coming from a small school in the middle of of actually in the panhandle of of Idaho and then you go on to ESPN a few years later what was that experience like for you I mean you know uh I think back in the day Merrill you know this that the NFL when you were done you literally went off a cliff you know and so the question was what were you going to do about that and and you know I've 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 had it took me probably two years to kind of find my way and then I found my 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 lane and today I, I work for you uh sports illustrated so it's been a good run for me but you know in terms of you making that transition the nfl pa has done a fantastic job with the trust and other tools like that to really help guys bridge that gap but back then man you're just kind of feeling your way and yeah. you know you landed into a great gig by the way uh probably the best dressed dude i've seen with the thick collar and the big tie looks <laughs> awesome on tv but how has that experience been for you in that transition well, um, again, product of a lot of people, right? Um, I got to go back and give credit to uh, Chuck Knoll, who had so much wisdom, who developed men, who developed people, um, developed you for life's work, not just football, because he would always talk about your life's work. And I remember the first time he was talking about it. I was like, and this was the time where you know, people were saying the game had passed Chuck by, you know, he didn't know what he was doing anymore. Um, ironically, it was our first game against the San Francisco 49ers. And he was talking about your life's work. You know, it's not, he, he'd do it in, in different ways uh, or different times. Most of the time it was the end of the season because now you're leaving to do other things. If you ever got destroyed by somebody, he definitely did then because he said, we're going to be doing our life's work a lot quicker than you thought if we keep playing like this. <laughs> <laughs> it gets your attention. But it was it was during training camp, actually. You know, and I think that's because, you know, a lot of people are going to get cut and, and then things are going to – obviously, people are going to be playing in the National Football League. But I'm thinking, what's he talking about? I'm playing this game as long as I'm on play this game. And then I played my first pro game. Okay, preseason ain't nothing yeah. like a real game. Okay, well, I put that, I, we kicked that ball off and I played my first third down. I was like, oh, he does know what he's talking about. Your life's work might happen after this game. I mean, anyway, um, he would always share that message. So, and he, he, part of that message was you have responsibility. You have an awesome platform. Use it, don't abuse it. And, you know, I, he got my attention early on. And I, I'm telling you, he was a guy 
then I, I think goodness, I was smart enough that every time I sat down in our team meetings, when he was holding court, I was like, okay, you may never come across another person like this in your life. What he shares with you, what he tells you, you better take notes and you better listen to. And so I actually listened to that. And he said in the off season, finish school, if that's what you got to do. But if that is not what you find something else you want to do when this game is over. And I started doing that about my second year. I remember I went to, I went into insurance. I went and it took me about two weeks to figure out that ain't for me, which is another advantage to doing these things. You know, Hey, that ain't for me versus being stuck, having to do something. You got no choice because you, you know, you got to have a job. So I got to explore a lot of things I did not like. I knew I wouldn't want to do. And because I had taken his counsel and listened to him, a part of my deal when I went to the Chicago Bears was I had I had did a a post a pre and post show for CBS um, for Chicago, and I had a two hour radio show on Monday Night Football at Walter Payton's restaurant, and that was part of my contract, part of my deal when I went there. So my broadcasting, the stuff I had been doing in Pittsburgh, blossomed over to that. And so when my career ended. It was actually the Steelers who called me back. I was the first uh, player in the in the broadcasting booth for them. And actually, Mr. Rooney's the one who gave me my my chance to do broadcasting after football. And I helped launch ESPN2 about that same time. They they were starting. Um, and you remember Craig James? Yeah. Now, CJ and I became, I went to some of his school. He did a kind of a boot camp broadcasting school. So part of investing, you know, in your life's work or doing something different. I, I invested in that. I went to that and he was at ESPN at the time and the way my career ended and with the Steelers hire, hire me to do their games, Roger, I mean, Craig James talked to ESPN about having me help them launch ESPN two with college football. And so I ended up doing both for about a year and a half until I went to ESPN full time. So what I'm getting at is there were so many people that, I just mentioned that helped me in that process, but I did do my part. You know, I was out there doing things and making people know that I, this is what I wanted to do. And uh, I was very interested in that and trying to do as much as I could to widen my scope and my net and all those people end up coming as part of it. And I'll tell you a guy, when you think about, and I'm sure this has probably happened to you guys. There was one guy who becomes a critical player in this was Mark Malone. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark Malone was the quarterback when I was my rookie year in Pittsburgh. Okay, they, I mean, Mark had the worst situation. He comes in and replaces Terry Bradshaw. There can't be anything worse than that, right? Yeah, then he comes to San Diego and tries to replace Dan Fouts. I was yes. there at the time. Uh -huh. okay. I was with Mark. Yeah, I coached when he was there. Yeah. So they trade him. They trade him to San Diego. So we, I remember we go, we go play you know, San Diego. I can't remember if we win there or not my, my rookie year. I can't remember. But um, I think Mark only played there a year. Maybe two, but I think it was just a year. Okay, so Mark comes back to Pittsburgh. He's now going into broadcasting. He's working for WPXI, the local, um, one of the local TV stations there. Now, Mark, when he was a player, man, like he didn't even know my name. When I got in the huddle. He wouldn't say boo to me. He didn't say boo to anybody. It was like Mark Malone. And keep in mind, John Stallworth was still around. Him and John Stallworth would kind of go over and talk. And just the rest of us were, I mean, we're nobody. Now, he didn't say my name. And everybody, nobody really liked Mark Malone. And so when he's now going to come down and going to come into the locker room, players hear about this immediately. Everybody's like, do not talk to him. <laughs> I mean, do not talk to him. We don't, he wasn't here to talk to us. They just really wanted to fire back. at him. So he goes, I'm not going to say the players, but he goes over to this one player. I watch him walk in the locker room and I'm like, that's the wrong dude to go to. Right. But he's, he's our big defensive guy. So you, you almost got to get him. And he turned around I, I can't say what he said, but he basically said, go fly a kite. Yeah. So I, I was like, oh. And then he walks over. And the next worst player he could pick, he picks him. He says the same thing. Now I see him coming to me. I'm like, oh, man. I think long and hard. I, and he just said, it's not in my makeup, right? It's just, I, I turned around. He said, hey, Merrill, can I, get an, can I get an interview with you? And I was like, absolutely, Mark. And so we do an interview. Okay, now listen, here's what here, two things happen. Every day comes a lot. Who's on TV more than anybody? Me. <laughs> he's on, he's always interviewing me and doing specials. I mean, but now let's fast forward some 10 years later. Okay. Eh, 10, 12 years later, about 12 years later. Mark as is at ESPN. Mark's a big player at ESPN. 
the matchup show that I ended up going full time to do at ESPN, one of the analysts had some issues. He kind of holds out. ESPN has to cut him or, or fires him in week five. They call Mark Malone up. They say, Mark, we have two options. They had this other player that was doing some other stuff, and Merrill Hodge were thinking about bringing on the matchup show full time. What do you think? Let's go back to that locker room. Yeah. When he's walking over to me, let's say I do what everybody else did to him. I'm not the ESPN. I'm telling that right now. Wow. And, then, and he and I become, I mean, really good friends. But my point was, I was like, you know, listen, I'm not saying you're a doormat and people run you over. You know, um, Mark wasn't like that. You know, he just didn't, he just didn't know, he didn't say talk to you. Then sometimes that's how it is when new players come in and there's an age difference, there can be that. But to, to go back and just be deliberately mean to him and cruel to him, you know, when he was starting a new thing, I was just like, man, that's so unfair to do to somebody. That's your character. That's your character. Hey, hey Mero, I, I want to I just mention really quickly, I'd been traded uh, in 1987 to the Saints. Jim's dad actually was the head coach. We went up to Pittsburgh and we played you guys, and we ended up beating you. And I've never seen any worse treatment for a quarterback or a player oh, yeah. Than Mark Malone. I mean, they had that their own fans were flying signs and just and that about uh, Mark. And I, I felt awful for him. And you beat the Steelers. It was a good win for us. But it was just like, you know, there was a lot of transition going on, obviously, at that time. Yeah. He, uh, yeah. He's yeah. such a good guy. He went He's through it. You brought something up, Mark Ash, you know, kind of preparing for your, your, you know, what's next. At UCLA, one of the big things that I put in place right away was just a mentorship program. And, uh, constantly talking about uh, what are you going to do after football? I never called it plan B. It was like, what's next? You know, and it was developing that passion because as you know, as well as anybody uh, in football in particular, you don't know when that career is going to end, you know, and for you, it ended in a way that, uh, you know, I would say was, was rather traumatic. I'm sure, you know, and for those that don't know, you know, you, you know, the, the, the first concussion in 94, it followed immediately by the second one where you had to be resuscitated and in spending time in intensive care. Can you just talk about where you were emotionally and mentally at that time and how you were able to get through it to get to the next really adverse situation was your non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and then your enlarged aorta surgery, all those things that you've gone through, but how you've been able to find your way or find a way through all of those things? Well, you know, I, I go back to what happened to me at age 12, and I the same thing happened ultimately when my career ended. You know, my career ended because, you know, people say uh, head trauma ended my career, concussion ended my career, and that's actually incorrect. Bad improper care ended my career. Right. Because if, if head trauma would have ended my career, I wouldn't have played after the Monday night game in Kansas City. My Wait, career been were you out there two weeks later after your first concussion? or? Yeah. Oh, okay. I get cleared over the phone to play five days later. Wow. So, you know, now listen, we, we you know, and, and that, that response now, because what we know now, now that's in 1994, but even in 1994 to get cleared over the phone is archaic. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in Pittsburgh for two years. We're already doing baseline testing. We've been doing baseline testing for a couple of weeks there. I mean, for a couple of years. So it's, it's archaic to get cleared over the phone. But that being said, and I, you talked about being in intensive care. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff. You know, when I went into cardiac arrest, I, I don't remember any of that. They, I, you know, everybody just told me about it. Um, intensive care, I don't remember anything there. But when I start coming around, you know, I was, I went, I got, into, I was, into, I was, I was depressed. I was, I was a wreck mentally. But there was a point where, you know, I looked at myself. I was laying on the couch. That's probably the the most pathetic I've ever been at any point in my life. <laughs> That's just the best way to put it. And I just, I really, there was a, a deep thought into me as I'm like, listen, you have responsibility here. You know, listen, I was feeling sorry for myself. My career was over. What I've been doing for almost two years, I can't do anymore. Um, I'm watching people play my position that, and I said, I was in my prime too. I mean, it wasn't like I was, on my way out, there was, you know, I was, I'd never missed a game for 11 years. I was, I was getting better physically and healthy. I was, but that being said, and so I'm playing all those cards in my head. And I remember laying on the couch. I, I remember thinking, you better do something about this, you know, and it was really those words, find a way, like taking action again, 
They inspire me to start doing stuff. That's when I start casting lines out for coaching and broadcasting. So I start really doing my due diligence because I felt I was interested in both. Whichever line caught, I would go. Like if the coaching line went, I would go that way. So those words inspired me to do something about my circumstances. And I go back to, I was in the, I was in the quitters locker room. I was pointing fingers, cast. I was making all kinds of excuses for where I was. Okay. And man, I had a lot of reasons to do that. At the end of the day, I'm going to stay in that locker room. I'm not going to go anywhere. And then I self-evaluated one day and I was like, you know, and then I was still struggling cognitively. Even when I get the job at ESPN, you know, um, I'm telling you, we, we taped our matchup shows. They were always taped and I'm very lucky. They were taped and I would tape them on Thursday. And then I go to ESPN and do shows Saturday and Sunday. But that taping got me to where I was cognitively good enough to do some live stuff. If I didn't have had that. Oh, it had been a disaster. So, and actually ESPN, that, that therapy of having to relearn things and cognitively do things and have exercises that actually ends up helping me cognitively, you know, get back, get back to normal. But it took a long time. You know, I mean, when I got diagnosed with cancer, it was my daughter who challenged. <laughs> I tell my kids about, you know, what the doctors told me. that I have a three-pound tumor. Um, I'm going to be sick. I'm going to lose my hair. I didn't tell them the part that devastated me the most. You know, my doctor told me when he hung up, he's like, you know, I can't guarantee this is going to work. You know, here you have cancer is one thing. But when they, they don't give you any hope from a perspective of treatment, and I get that because there's no guarantees. I mean, that's why we're still trying to find treatments to get, you know, so no, nobody would, you know, that, so no, nobody, cancer doesn't take them away. The targeted therapies are where we're going. But I remember I've never heard those words before. And it was, I was consumed by, you know, chemotherapy and dying, to be honest with you. And it was my daughter, uh, who's nine at the time. She gets across the room. She said, she said, I didn't realize that she's sitting in my lap. She's got her arms around my neck. And she's, I mean, she's really trying to get my attention because I was so absorbed in the self-pity and the doom and gloom. And she's like, well, then, Dad, you better find a way. Mm -hmm. And I was like, about you talk about, like, that's what I needed. I mean, and a nine-year-old did it. You know, I was like, ah. Oh. And, okay, then dying wasn't an option. Feeling sick and tired of myself, not an option anymore. Then my mind starts focused on, how do I beat it? You know, and then, and that just sent me on a journey that there was just one, again, product of a lot of people. I get a hold of people who had been through the treatment, shared it with me, and they they gave the real truth of it. They because they they'd lived it, you know, from burned holes. You know, I they were talking about chemo burning through your body. I'm like, they never said anything about that when I was in the doctor's offices, but they had all made it. And see, that gave me hope. Right. And there was some things in the conversation that, that gave me hope. Um, have an open heart surgery. Honestly, I'm going to tell you this. This is the craziest. You'll understand this after I explain a little bit. If I don't have cancer, I'm not doing this call with you right now. We're not having this conversation right now because that defected my aorta probably ruptured by now. And I'd be dead. There's no, he said, I asked the doctor when we, when they found it and they found it because they do pet cat scans with to follow up and see if there's any cancer return. So there's this really detailed look at your body, which most people don't ever do because you only have that if they're really concerned of cancer, to be honest with you, or something that they know is a defect. Well, I clearly didn't know that there was a defect. So I asked the doctor, I go, how, how would you figure this out? Had you not seen it on my last pet cat scan, by the way, too, the day after I have that one, I never have another one for the last 17 years. I haven't had one. He's like, probably in your autopsy. Oh, <laughs> so sometimes the worst thing you could imagine happening in your life ends up being the best thing that ends up happening because without cancer i i am I'm, we're not doing this zoom call and i know that the way it's been you probably thought that was never gonna happen the way i was operating with these machines but um i'm glad i had cancer in because uh I, I am not here I, I know that for a fact i'm not here well, that also, you know, gets right back to the theme of the show, right? Finding your summit. And in, in, in a lot of cases, you can't go around it. You got to go through it. And the, the real reasons, the answers don't reveal themselves for years to come. I can say that for sure on multiple peaks and multiple valleys that I've bounced up and down. Jim's been through the same thing on a personal level and a professional level, both of us. And, um, 
you know, and that's where that word perspective really kicks in on when thing, bad things happen to you and they happen to all of us. You just got to kick it back and know there's something better to come. And you got to you may, you may not know that answer and you may not know that answer for 10 years, but it's going to kick in if you keep fighting and doing all those things, finding a way, all the little details that you were talking about on how to achieve those types of goals. Yeah. Well, there's no doubt about that. I'm glad you guys do this. I, you know, hopefully people will garner something from it. And I tell people all the time, just take it and apply how it works in your life. You know, there's, I don't, I don't believe in there's five steps to success in life and everybody follows those five steps. You're going to be, well, if that, it's yeah. not that easy. Do you have to do your part in everything in life? Absolutely. That, you know, that's one part, but your part, I mean, Jim's part, my part, that might, depends on our journey. Depends on what we're going after. Those are all, all subjectively different, but who can help us? Who can inspire us? What can we garner from other people? And I emphasize that just because I'm a product of so many people. I, I you know, I'm, uh, I was great. I was glad I finally, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry last week I screwed you guys up, by the way. I still pile you a big apology for that. But, you know, to see Jim and his well, face. You're getting man. a letter from the commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> we sent uh, you that video from about 8,000 feet, bro. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful guys in the West. I mean, I miss the West. You guys are a beautiful part of the country. And there's great Come peace. Come back out here to Idaho. We'll, uh, we'll go up a mountain together. Well, you know, I was just actually, I, um, Ben Roethlisberger and I just went on, we were just in Salmon, Idaho on a big wolf bear hunt. Okay. Just in, yeah, right. We just got, well, I mean, it's been, it feels like an, an eternity now, but it was March, April, March, whenever bear season was. It was around late April, somewhere in March. We were, you know, and I, now listen, I grew up in that state. I've been up to Sam and Idaho on uh, little league tournaments, but I'd never really been in the mountains over there. I mean, that's just, that's a rugged, it reminded me of British Columbia a lot. Like, I mean, British Columbia is rugged. It is steep and it is wicked. I didn't realize how wicked it was. Well, we'll be going uphill here as soon as we're done talking to you. That's our, yeah, you're I mean, a lucky dog, man. I'm well, I think, you know, as you get older here and you're, you're an ex athlete or ex coach, and you've always been a competitor, you know, Mark has this goal of, obviously of us uh, being the first NFL player to uh, climb the seven summits. He would have, I think, accomplished Everest had not the COVID hit. But uh, for me, I think for Mark every day, it's like, okay, there's that hill. And, you know, we got to get our two or three or 4,000 vertical feet in today. No matter how much it hurts, we're, we're going up. Four o'clock, we go up the hill. And it's uh, – Carol, actually, Jim, it was uh, looked at – we have – there's a tracker that we use, Strava, and we – Jim, there's a – we were in a social thing last night, and somebody asked how many feet had we – climbed this month then we track it by month so we still have one more day to go but as for the month Dude, of july today and tomorrow today and tomorrow that's right we've gone sixty four thousand vertical feet so that's getting after it um so let me ask you this where can people find you because i know you have a website it's cool stuff yeah um well the, the easiest way is merrillhodge.com it's m-e-r-r-i-l-h-o-g-e.com um and I, I spell it out because everybody my all my names are spelled wrong but based on how people yeah. spell them. So two r's one l no d and hodge just I'll put it all together and really everything all this stuff and information is is really there from the books i've written to my speaking and what i'm passionate about today and and what moves me um so um you can find all that and i appreciate you guys having me on it's good seeing your faces man Jealous you're going to the mountains too, by the way. Uh-huh. Well, listen, hey, I appreciate it from my standpoint. I know it's it's good getting caught up with your old buddy Jamora. Yeah, Absolutely. Man. I appreciate you, man. I always have oh, tremendous respect for you. And just hearing your story again is uh it's very inspiring. I hope I know that people will be inspired by it. So thanks, pal. Well, thank you, boys. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right, there he is, Merrill Hodge. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. Okay, if you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Patterson, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, nfl.com. So until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye.